So getting back, I did have one question during the break that I just want to make sure that we cover um, because I don't know that I was as clear as I could have been or if it occurred before this individual came in. So I just want to make sure that I come back to this point. Whether you create a trust or not, you should still have a will. Okay. The idea is we're trying to transfer things out of your own name so that we can avoid the probate process. But as I mentioned, people leave things out of their trust all the time. You might create your trust this year, and then 10 years from now, you might sell your property, buy a new property, and completely forget to put it in the trust. So what is going to govern that property? Not your trust, because your trust doesn't own it. So we need to get it to your trust. In those circumstances, what we really want to have happen is for your will to act as what's known as a pour over will. That literally means is that it's just there to catch stuff. And this is a little hokey example. I use my little trapeze example. So if you think of your trust as being a little trapeze and all of your stuff is supposed to be neatly and nicely on this little trapeze, the will is the net that's underneath to make sure that this property doesn't fall into intestate succession. Intestate literally means without a will, without any sort of governing document. And if your trust doesn't own it and you don't have a will, Guess what that property is? It's an intestate property. And so what happens is then that goes by the way that the law says it should go. Now, in some cases, it's gonna be the exact same effect as the document that you may have created, other than the fact that your document may say that property gets held for a certain period of time or something like that. But for example, if you're a single marriage, and I don't mean single versus plural marriage because that's not there's not a law for that either, um, at least in this state now. Um, but what I mean is not a second marriage or something along those lines where the spouse may not be the parent of the surviving children or something like that. And you can see how this can get very complicated. Um, but it's very interesting and it's very nice to be able to work through it with people. And I actually find estate planning to be a very happy practice area. I know that sounds really demented, but most of the people leave my office really happy because they had this on their mind for a really long time. They didn't know what was gonna happen. We put the documents together and everybody leaves and they're like, okay, now I don't need to think about this for a while. Um, and so it's actually a pretty happy process overall. And I try to make it fun. We have consults all the time and people on the outside are like, what were you guys talking about in there? I'm like, oh, it was a state planning consult. They were like, why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> I was like, because why not make it fun? Why not let it be fun? Um, but anyway, the point being, you should still have a will to make sure that it, it doesn't end up in intestate succession. What the will will essentially say is, all right, my bad. I was supposed to put this in the trust. It didn't get there. Hey, personal representative, can you make sure my trustee gets this? And that way it can be distributed according to the terms of the trust. And that's why we're still gonna want that document in place. Now I have gotten in a fight with a woman on the phone as politically appropriate and polite as I could be. She really wanted a trust and did not want a will. <laughs> and I would not create that for her because you know what would happen? Her kids in 20 years would look at me and go, what the heck did you do? She didn't put anything in this trust and now we have no document that says where this stuff should go. So I, if you come and you need a trust, I'm still gonna create a will for you. Um, any lingering questions from stuff we may have covered so far? Did that answer your question? Okay. So the revocable trust, this is the most common document. So essentially the vast majority of estate plans that I create contain four documents healthcare power of attorney, financial power of attorney, will, and a revocable trust, okay? The revocable trust, also known as a living trust or an inter vivos trust, is flexible, very flexible, because you can change it at any time. And it's the most commonly used form of trust. You, as the creator, also known as a grantor, also known as a trustor, also known as a settlor, <laughs> I like grantor, I don't know why, but I just do grants, maybe that's why, property to a trustee, which is usually you, you grant the property though during your lifetime, and essentially sever the legal title from the beneficial enjoyment of the property. So in that example I gave before, you own property. On your title it says you own property. I know if I wanna buy the property, I find you. In this situation, you own property. You transfer property to yourself as trustee of your trust. 
Now the trust owns the property. Something happens to you, I don't need to worry about who I need to find to sell me the property. I know I just need to find the trustee. And that's why we don't have to go through the probate process for that property. That property can transfer, the trustee can manage it immediately and make sure it gets sold or liquidated or whatever it is that they want to do. Not that sold or liquidated wouldn't be the same thing. I recognize that as soon as I said it. But it might be where they just transfer property to the beneficiaries. Um, Yes, in a revocable trust situation. And the grantor. And the, grantor. And the beneficiary. And the beneficiary. It's a trifecta. <laughs> yes, you get to be all things to yourself all the time. Um, and that's the reason that you can avoid probate there, but that's also the reason why you don't avoid your creditors, like my little Amex example before, because you're all of those people. And there's no distinction between you as the grantor and you as the trustee and you as the beneficiary. But that's why people like revocable trusts, because nobody else gets to tell them what happens to their property. And that's why they're the more commonly used document. Unlike in an irrevocable trust, where you have to give a third party someone who is somewhat neutral, not someone who you can control, the right to control the property. Because you have to create that distinction, that gap between you as the person that can do everything and that person that actually needs permission to do something, and that's what takes it out of your estate. So, yes? So at the time of your death, the trustee switches from you to whoever you have named as the trustee? Correct. So, so you the, can name more than one? Yes. So the question is, upon your death, the trustee becomes whomever you've named in your trust, and you can name more than one. And the answer to both of those is yes. What happens is, um, in, a, in a married situation, it's usually both spouses um, as co-trustee, because we generally, in, in Arizona, create joint trusts, as opposed to each spouse having their own trust, <clears throat> although there are circumstances where that may be appropriate. Um, if, it, if everything has, if they've decided to forgo community property and everything is separate property, then maybe it is appropriate to have a separate trust document. But in most cases, for a married couple, it's going to be a joint document. And so, as long as, and then you can decide, do you want it to remain fully revocable when the first of you dies, understanding the risk that that spouse might remarry or something along those lines, or you can make it so that they get kind of a limited right to control and continue to control whatever was theirs, but with respect to your half of the estate, you can keep that an irrevocable and kind of not let the spouse have full access. Now, that was the way that it used to be done very commonly when the estate tax exemption amount was much lower. Um, this five plus million dollar is relatively new. And so, and it's indexed for inflation, so it's gonna to continue to grow. And it's considered a permanent tax. <laughs> Meaning it's not expected to go down as of right now, that exemption amount. Um, but anything over that gets taxed at a really high rate of up to 40%. So that's why we need to be mindful of that. When the exemption amount was lower, it made a lot more sense to divide the estate on the death of the first spouse. With an $11 million exemption amount collectively between the two spouses, it's less of an issue. Um, so as long as the grantor has capacity, capacity, he, and I'm using he in the royal sense, he, she, they can change the, the um, document at any time. Asset transfers. So the most important thing to remember with a trust, because I have seen this before, you do not want to be in the situation of trying to fund this thing post-mortem. And you don't want to leave, well, you obviously won't have that problem because you'll be the deceased party. But post-mortem trust funding is really problematic. And so we need to make sure that these asset transfers occur while you're living. Okay. Now, one of the things that I always try to make sure that we do is talk about what it is that you own at the outset so that we know what we need to transfer and move around. And I help prepare the deeds and those sorts of things and get those recorded so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, we can also work with your financial planner if you're working with a planner and make sure because they have all your accounts and they know where everything is and we can make sure that all of these accounts that can be changed do get changed. Or for example, with retirement accounts and those sorts of things, maybe it's not appropriate for the person, it's not appropriate for the 
owner to be the trust, but we can make sure that the trust ends up as a contingent beneficiary of the plan and, and things like that. So we try and do a really broad overview of what you have and do what we can to help you guys transfer this stuff while you're living. Now I say during life or at death, ideally during life, but at death certain things may transfer. For example, um, if it's a life insurance policy and you've designated the trust as the contingent beneficiary or the primary beneficiary, that's going to get transferred to your trust at death. Um, or something that gets caught by the will might get transferred at death. And that's, that all goes to the idea of that you may need to change the owners or the beneficiaries. And we talk about what's appropriate under each circumstance with respect to each asset because it's not always going to be the same thing. And we usually don't displace the spouse. The spouse can, it's usually perfectly good to have the spouse named as the primary beneficiary. But if we've got multiple children or minors or incapacitated parties, we really need to be careful that they don't necessarily get an outright distribution of that. So for example, when we had that discussion about the pay on death designation and whether that controls, going back to the idea that it's a contract with a third party, if you designate that you want it to go to your three children in equal shares, if one of those children happens to be a special needs individual, and this comes up a lot, getting that gift could displace their aid. So if they're receiving Social Security disability income or something like that, and if you've ever gone through the process of trying to get somebody qualified for that, it is a nightmare. And you do not want to have to redo that process because they received this gift. So it can be really important that a person doesn't get that property outright and the trust can help make sure that that doesn't happen. So it can essentially say, all right, instead of this person getting the outright gift, and instead of it even being in the discretion of the trustee to distribute, we're gonna put even more stringent guidelines in place so that it doesn't displace whatever state or federal aid that person may be receiving. Because $60,000, if somebody wanted to drop that in my pocket right now, I would not be upset. So I'm just throwing that out there. But if you're receiving state or federal aid, $60,000 is not going to cover your expenses for a long enough period for the amount of headache that that is going to create. And sometimes it's better for the person to just wave off the gift or there's some serious planning that has to go into place before they accept anything. So it can be really helpful to keep those things in mind because you might not just be saving yourself a headache, you could be saving your, you might be thinking you're doing the beneficiary a good thing and end up having it not be so great. Yeah, assets, so the question is assets could include life insurance policies. Yeah, so assets are essentially everything that you own. Um, everything that you own, tangible, intangible, digital assets. Um, that's kind of, I sh should probably throw a slide in here about that. It's an emerging area of the law. Facebook accounts. I think Facebook has finally created something where you have an option now to name someone on your Facebook account <coughs> to be able to administer that upon your death. But sometimes, especially younger people, ask them if they've ever developed a role of film. If you want to feel like really old, right? They look at you like, what's film? Like, you know, they used to have the little huts and everything. You go and you drop the film off. But now, th most of these people, their lives are completely digital. All the pictures that they might have might be completely 100% digital. And so um, we, we do our best because the circumstances, again, of the law being a little bit behind, and we don't have statutory provisions that say what happens to that stuff. We're governed, again, by those third-party contracts. Depends on what Facebook says. It depends on what Kodak Easy Share says about what can happen to those assets. And so um, in our documents, we do put in a clause about those to kind of cover them that says, here's the person I want to be in charge of those. Because think about it, some of these digital assets could be a little compromising. Thing, right? What's that? Like iTunes. iTunes. Right. Yeah, iTunes became a big battle, and I don't recall off the top of my head how that came out, but essentially it was the idea that iTunes was arguing, essentially, that you just purchased a license to listen to it, a license that was specific to you. Unlike a CD, where you had a tangible manifestation, 
that you could easily transfer to somebody else and nobody would care. So the argument was that iTunes should be treated more like the CD. And I believe that's the way it came down, but I don't recall specifically. Um, so those are all things that are assets that might be considered. Subscriptions, people have online subscriptions to things. Those things need to get canceled. Sometimes they're on auto debit or something like that. And so the person needs to know what all of this stuff is. So we do try to kind of get you thinking about all the stuff that you've got and thinking about what a nightmare it would be for somebody else to go through it. My mother has this giant trunk filled with like old records and one other giant trunk filled with photos. I'm like, if you don't do something about that before something happens to you, we are not going to be friends anymore. <laughs> of course, she probably won't care because she won't be here. But I tease her about it all the time. Uh, because I, the idea of going through that giant box, it will end up being a giant box that my children end up going through because nothing will probably ever happen to it. So um, keep, keep those things in mind. So um, this asset protection, this was the slide I said we were going to skip later. But just as a reminder, it's not an asset protection tool for you. Now, your beneficiaries under your revocable trust, because it's not revocable for them, they have to take whatever you've provided for them in the document and, and have to deal with whatever you've written in there. So it is an asset protection tool for them. So if your child is in creditor trouble or beneficiary, some of you I'm sure may not have children, but for a beneficiary, they, they, the trustee can essentially say, they didn't leave this money to pay all of that bad debt over there. I'm going to hold on to it. As you need things, I'll make little distributions to you. But it shouldn't ever become subject to the creditor's right to invade the trust and take the money. So who is the, the, the trustee typically? Who do people name? So typically, after the spouse. right, after themselves and the spouse. So the question is, who do people typically name as a trustee? Um, Adult children are number one pick. Sp uh, siblings, forgive me, not spouses. Siblings are another option. Um, and then you can also name, um, there, are, there are private fiduciaries, essentially, that are trustees. That, that's what they do. It's their profession. They're not necessarily affiliated with a major national bank or trust company. They might be a private fiduciary, locally based. Um, just be mindful that they have a good kind of history of doing these things. Uh, attorneys can be named, and bank and trust companies can be named. Most bank and most banks, national banks, have a trust division, um, including Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Northern Trust, Fine Mark Bank and Trust. Like they all have these things. Yeah, and they do. They do actually really. They do a really nice job. They tend to be Im more impartial. And so sometimes, if there's a unique circumstance, people get nervous because the bank might not be as sympathetic as <clears throat> Aunt Sue, right? who you might be able to manipulate a little bit more. Um, but that can be really helpful in certain circumstances. Question? With regards to asset protection, this refers to treasures. What about if um, someone is injured on your property and tries mm -hmm. to sue you? Mm -hmm. if you Right. So if the question is, if your property is in a trust and someone gets injured on your property and they want to sue you, they would become a judgment, judgment creditor, essentially. Um, so they'd fall into the same category. And so um, the question being, would that protect you? If it's a revocable trust, no. If it's an irrevocable trust, now irrevocable trust with respect to property can be tricky because you still want to reserve the right to live there, presumably. Um, but sometimes people have multiple properties and maybe they have a property in another state that who cares if they don't have the right to control it because they still can go and visit it like a timeshare kind of a thing. Um, so no, it wouldn't be uh, protection. What I strongly recommend just as an aside with respect to liability um, and those sorts of things is Insurance is one of the best options under those circumstances. Um, having a, a general liability policy is great. The more exposure you have to liability, the more strongly I recommend umbrella policies of some kind uh, just to cover those policy limits. When those policy limits are exhausted, then your assets are fair game. And so 
put some extra layers on there. They're usually four or five hundred dollars a year for a million plus in coverage, and that can be really, really helpful because you know, I, it comes up fairly frequently that something unexpected, kind of bizarre, but really severe happens, and now all this stuff is on the table. And once that happens, like I said, it's really hard to move stuff then. So all of this planning, the hard part is it can be expensive to do asset protection planning because you're moving things out of your estate and we have to do all sorts of extra planning and drafting. And so a lot of times people don't think the expense makes sense when there isn't an issue. But once there's an issue, <laughs> then we really can't do what we need to do. Okay? Or there's a, more, there's a much higher likelihood that what we do will be set aside. Irrevocable trusts. Transferring property to an irrevocable trust removes the property from your estate. Now that's both for tax purposes, creditor protection purposes, and probate purposes. It comes out of your estate as though you don't own it. You're no longer the title holder. The grantor, you can derive significant tax and asset protection benefit, but you can't retain as much control over the property. You can retain some, but the more control you retain, the less the value is moved out of your estate for tax purposes. So for example, if you've got a couple of million dollars and you're worried about that threshold creeping up on you and you try and move a million dollar property or something out of your estate, if you reserve the right to live in it full time, the transfer over there is not going to be at 100%. It's gonna be at a significantly lower amount than that. And so it may still be subject to all of these other things. Generally speaking, it can't be modified, but again, there's su such a thing called decanting. You can decant an irrevocable trust into a new irrevocable trust. So it's not as though you can get rid of the trust entirely, although I suppose with the proper judicial authority or, or request, you probably could get one set aside in its entirety if, for example, it wasn't economically feasible to continue it or something along those lines. But by and large, you have to move it to a new irrevocable trust, and there's all sorts of limits on what that new trust can say. Yes? So um, at your desk, what's the process to determine that that person has a will and a trust or not? Oh, that's a good question. So the question was, at once someone dies, how do we figure out whether they have a will or a trust or anything like that? Um, most of the time, the recommendation is that once these documents are created, that they be kept in a safe place at home where someone knows where to look for them. Um, so the person is basically going to just scrounge around in their stuff <laughs> and try and find the documents. Um, if nothing else, like if the person doesn't want to share the documents right away, then typically what I recommend is that you give that person the contact information of the attorney that may have drafted it for you um, so that they can contact them because we, re we retain um, electronic copies of the documents that we prepare so that in the event, I've had to fax them to hospitals before because something happened and they needed to get a copy of it. Um, but it's really kind of not a very sophisticated process. <laughs> uh, you can register it. You can file a, a certificate of trust, essentially, with the Maricopa County Recorder. But most people don't want to do that because the idea of the trust is that it's private and you don't have to disclose it. So people don't usually do that. So it's really just a matter of making sure someone knows where to look for them. Okay, so in other words, the state does not know. Right. Right. And there's no way, no way to know. That's right. This is somewhere. Right. So the state has the state has no way to know was essentially the question. And and yes, that's right. I mean, it's a private document that you have the right to change at any time. You could tear it up at, uh, on your deathbed and like eat it if you wanted to. <laughs> if you were really mad at someone, no, I'm gonna eat, whatever. Um, but yes, they have no reason to know. Yes. Okay, so question one. Yeah, they were very good questions. Everybody's got such good questions. This means you're paying attention, which makes me so happy. Um, okay, so the first question was, if you prepare these documents and you file them somewhere, it, do they have kind of an expiration period, kind of like a lien where you have to re, um, refile that lien to keep it fresh or something along those lines? Um, no, not really. 
Um, the older they are, the more strongly they'll be scrutinized. So it is helpful to keep them updated. And then the second part of your question, it's in here. I just have to find it. OK. If you register them with the county, do you have to re-register them? Oh, or are they perpetual? Like, do they expire? So if you create the documents, do they expire after a certain period of time? No, they are con they're considered perpetual. As long as they were properly created at the time and, and pursuant to law, then they are considered valid in whatever state where they're presented even. So even if you move to another state, they would be considered a valid document in that state under the full faith and credit clause, essentially, where the states honor each other's stuff. But there might be a nuance in the state where you move that you can draft around. So what I recommend is if people are moving and they already have their documents, it doesn't hurt to get a consultation with a local attorney to get a couple of clauses updated because they may be different in, in a different state. Well, okay. You mentioned you, you retain an electronic mm -hmm. version of the documents, mm -hmm. right? I assume this is confidential, so you're not going to release those documents. Without proper authority. Right. Right. So what does that mean? Like, uh, Somebody contact you and say, I'd like to see the will of Mr. X. What do you ask for? Um, OK, so the question is, if I'm retaining the paper records or the electronic copy, essentially, we don't retain any paper. This whole paper-free movement took me a really long time to get over that. I like paper. But what happens is, if we've got this electronic copy and someone randomly calls me on the phone and says, I need to see the will of so-and-so, Attorneys are bound by very, very strict confidentiality rules. It's like the sacrosanct. We can't disclose this under any circumstances to anybody um, unless we know that we have proper authority. So one of the first things that we'll do is obviously request why, why they need to know. You know, is the person deceased? Um, because I, I'm not even really supposed to disclose that someone's a client, that even just that is confidential. So. Um, what we need to do is make sure that this person, like if, sometimes they're the person named in the document. Yeah. So I can look at the document, but I will request a copy of the death certificate if the person is deceased, and I will request some sort of indication that the person is who they say they are. But in some ways, it's, it's a leap of faith at a certain point, but I have to assume that the person has that best interest in mind, but I do everything that I can to make sure that the person has the authority to have the document, because I don't want to be in the middle of something like that. Yes. When you have an exec set up an executor, is um, it usually a paid? Are they usually paid out of the estate, or is that just up to? That's a very good question. The so the question is: Is the executor paid, essentially, out of the estate, or do the beneficiaries have to pay that person? Is that or, kind of the secondary they, question? You know, in the case of it being a sibling, they just do it out of the kindness. Of their or can heart. they do it out of the kindness of their heart? Okay, so. Um, Pursuant to Arizona law, all trustees are entitled to compensation. That means that they have to be paid unless they waive their right to be paid. So if someone says that they want to do it out of the goodness of their heart, my recommendation is get that in writing <laughs> so that they don't later send a bill. Um, and that way you have it for posterity. Uh, the other thing is reasonable compensation. What does that mean? Uh, what, one of the things that I think is best to look at, those uhs are going to sound terrible on the recording, by the way. The, what I like to try and recommend is, as a baseline, whatever that person is customarily paid for whatever position they may hold is going to be a reasonable standard of reasonable. Because if they are getting paid $20 an hour for the work that they perform, and then they're having to do this on top of their own work and their own financial management and household stuff, then it's probably reasonable. And they would get paid out of the estate, not, not per the individuals. Yeah. So that comes off as one of those just debts. Um, but they can waive their right to receive it. Personal representative, it's not as um, black and white, but I, they can be paid for the position. Um, they also may have to post a bond if they're a personal representative. Uh, by law, they're supposed to post a bond. We usually draft around that. What does that exactly mean? Good question. What does it mean to post a bond? So to post a bond, essentially, this person is going to be put in charge of all of the stuff that you own. 
And so if they're a party that we don't have any reason to believe that you wanted them there necessarily, or you didn't say anything in your will about it, then they have to post a bond, which essentially means that they get a little certificate, essentially. They pay a certain amount, which is usually less than whatever the court sets for that bond, but it essentially protects your estate. And it says, let's say your estate is worth $300,000. They post a bond that says that if the personal representative does something wrong, this bond will cover whatever they messed up in whatever amount they messed up. And you will be made whole beneficiary. In most of the documents that we prepare, because it's family members, everybody's a family member, the personal representative is a family member, the beneficiaries are family members, most of the time we waive bond. And we say that specifically in the document. Any other questions before I move forward? Yeah. You know, um, with trustees, if it is a bank or some kind of institution, mm -hmm. this state would have a set fee, right? It isn't like what that person's bank <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So the question is, in the case of a bank or trust company, do they have a customary mm -hmm. fee as opposed to whatever that person in the bank's going wage is at that moment? And the answer is yes. They have a schedule of fees. There's usually some sort of flat amount and then a percentage based on the size of the estate. Um, tends to be in the one to three percent range of the assets overall. Usually the minimum fees are about $2,500 to $3,000 a year for the management. So the smaller the estate, the less we really want it to continue being um, managed because we want to make sure that we're not wasting the money on fees and that most of it is going. But if they're investing it and it goes, then that's great. I was just going to say that every state has different uh, rules about fees for the trustee. That's right. Or the personal representative. Yeah, and those are the things that you want to be mindful of if you're moving. And you could even say, if you wanted to, you could try and set reasonable. You could say up to X number of dollars a year to manage the estate, and that'll depend on the size of your estate. Yes, sir. For some of us that are Arizona and somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, is Arizona a good state to file, or would, should we, how do we compare? Well, one of the things that you might consider is uh, income tax. Certain states that don't have income tax, so if that's the state where you're residing in, uh, because the trust will be subject to income tax, and so look at that as a possibility. For some of the larger trusts, sometimes you'll look out of state to a state that doesn't have that as the situs for administration, because you can potentially have a lot of tax savings. So that's usually the strongest impetus for having it in a state other than Arizona. Uh, by and large, most of them will be controlled in Arizona. It's a fairly friendly state because we do have a trust code. Look also, does it have a trust code or does it have really squirrely statutory provisions on how trusts are managed? Because in Massachusetts, for example, you can't necessarily decant an irrevocable trust, probably because of all the old money that's back there. But in Arizona, you can. So um, it depends on what the primary motivations are for the particular individual, but those are kind of the basics. Okay, uh, I think we only have a couple of slides left, which is good, because if you can believe it, we only have 15 minutes left. Um, I know, it's so exciting. Okay, charitable objectives. If you have current charitable objectives, and this is something that, I, it's not a plug for KJZZ. In fact, when I was putting this material together the first time, they didn't request any of this at all, but this is something that I do talk about with all of my clients. If you have an existing charitable, objectives that, charitable objective that you would like to continue, we can do that with your plan. If maybe you don't want them to necessarily get something in advance of all of the stuff being distributed to your children, or something like that, then you can name it as a contingent. Because we all like to consider that something is going to happen to our children or whomever we've named as a beneficiary long after us, but that's not necessarily always the case. And so I like to make sure that there is a fail safe. We're drafting these documents to make sure that we have as few holes as possible because the holes have to be filled in by the court and we really don't want that to happen. So what we normally do is we say to children or whomever you've named as the beneficiaries, and then we discuss, okay, what if that person isn't there? And then usually it goes to the grandchildren or maybe it goes to the surviving children or however, we can make it go however we want. The idea is that we want it to be like a chocolate fountain. 
where it just keeps coming back up and going back down until it's all distributed because we don't want there to be a gap. And a great way to make sure there's ultimately no gap ever is to add a charity because the charity is going to be there or we can give it to their eleomoisonary successor, <laughs> which is essentially a fancy word for whoever has taken over whatever their charity was and is doing the same thing. So if you named, like, for example, the uh, American Cancer Society or something like that, if on the odd chance the American Cancer Society isn't there anymore, but there is the United States Cancer Society, well, they can distribute it to them. Um, I do like to make sure that we look up the EIN numbers wherever possible, because I have seen where they thought they named one charity, but it actually said a city and state of a different city and state than where that charity was located. And guess what? That charity was also there. And so who was the right person? The world may never know. But um, we were able to, it was, it was resolved, but those things happen. Um, so you can either gift outright, make a bequest in your will, or do a charitable trust. Now, charitable trusts are a nice way when we've got that extra money lying around that we don't want to end up um, getting taxed or something like that, then you can do one of, of essentially two forms. You can either do a charitable lead trust, which means that during your lifetime, income generated off of whatever property you've transferred to this trust goes to the charity and the remainder goes to your beneficiaries. Or you can have it go the opposite way, which is that the charity doesn't get anything during your lifetime. Income goes to your beneficiaries, maybe your children or your siblings or something like that. And then the remainder, charitable remainder trust, I was looking for that word, the remainder goes to the charity. And it has different benefits. And the reasons, most often the reason why that happens is there's enough to go around or the person had a significant experience. Maybe they received a kidney or something and so they want to make a distribution to the kidney foundation. And maybe it's a $5,000 gift off the top, but it just makes them feel real good. When we do put in monetary amounts, I do try to always make sure that we list it as some percentage up to a maximum of $5,000 because for all we know, as of the date of your death, your estate might be worth $4,000, and then the charity gets everything and everything else, everybody else gets nothing. So we do try to be mindful of that when we're drafting. Maybe there's nobody else to name, and then there is a tax benefit to doing that as well. <clears throat> so the most important reason why you create an estate plan is because if you don't, the state essentially imposes one for you. Going back to that intestate succession, if you don't create a document, the state has certain statutes that say what happens to your property upon your death. And it may be to a spouse, and if that, but if that spouse is not also the father or mother of your surviving children, then it gets allocated differently than if it's the survivor and the children are all of the, that person as well. And so a lot of times there are lots of reasons to draft around those statutory provisions. So if you don't want the, state to make one for you, then you should write it down. But if you, the surviving spouse, both spouses die, right? No. So the question was, if, is that when both spouses die? So for example, if we've got a second marriage situation, the spouse dies who had the children. The other spouse is not the parent of those surviving children. So now we've got second spouse. There may be two sets of children, but for purposes of this, we're only worried about the person who died, blood children. Now, if those children are also the children of the surviving spouse, well, then we get really complicated. But for example, um, what would happen is now you've got the surviving spouse and the children of the deceased spouse. Surviving spouse, if there's no document, doesn't get 100%. They get a certain percentage they get all of their own, you know, their own separate property and their half of the community property. But they will only get a portion of the community property, or uh, the separate property of the surviving spouse. And I don't believe that they get any of the community property of the surviving spouse. Don't quote me on that. I'd have to double check. So those are not governed by insurance. Right. So. The question is, under those circumstances in intestate succession, we're in that realm, 
what about the retirement assets or life insurance where a different beneficiary scheme may have been designated? Again, those control. So the retirement assets and the life insurance policy would not be governed by the statutes that govern intestate succession because they're not technically intestate. There is a document that controls the distribution of those assets. So that's a very good question. But that's also why you might end up with first spouse getting being the beneficiary of the insurance policy if that hasn't been updated. So really you need to make sure that those beneficiary designations are what you want them to be. Um, so ideally, we all like, to, I don't know about you, but I really like to control stuff. <laughs> I really like to be in charge of stuff. Uh, and so I like to take the opportunity to make sure that I say what happens to all of this stuff. And the idea is you can too. You can be a control freak too. And if you put this stuff in writing, then that's what's going to govern. Yes? Sure. So the question is a ballpark figure for the basic plan we talked about today, those four documents, the powers of attorney, a will, and a trust, uncomplicated family situation. It is an impossible question to answer, and I don't want to be held necessarily to this, but just in my experience in terms of the ballpark figure where we end up is for an individual, we end up in the $1,400 range. For a married couple, we end up in the $2,500 range for that sort of stuff. And that includes some basic assistance with getting assets transferred as well. And then for, for the trust, what is the... So that includes, that includes a revocable trust. Oh, that, that, uh, that, those, that you gave to us. Yes. That's correct. Yeah, it includes a revocable trust. If we're talking about irrevocable planning, it really depends on what type of asset we're trying to move. For example, an ILIT, an irrevocable life insurance trust, which is designed solely to hold a life insurance policy. Because sometimes someone might have a $4 million policy. We've written one for a $23 million policy. So when those things happen, we don't want those assets to ever potentially become part of the estate. And so we put it into an ILIT. Those start at $1,200, but can go as high as $12,000, depending on the complexity of it. But the real basic run-of-the-mill stuff is in the, is in the $2,500 range, all in with all that stuff. Um, a couple of little things, food for thought. These are just additional things to be thinking of. And this was one, the second one, is one that came up last time, which hasn't come up in today's discussion. But just be really really careful about co-ownership. Okay. This happens all the time. Client comes to me, oh, don't worry, my child is named as a signer on my account. Actually, your child is named as a co-owner of your account, which means that if your child gets in a car accident, this is one of their assets, even though it's your money, and it may be subject to their creditors. Also, co-owner becomes surviving owner upon the death of the first person. So if it's a major asset, like your home, if they've been put on title as a co-owner, they are now the person that is the surviving owner and they have no legal obligation to share. <laughs> so they're like, oh, but I, they are gonna share with Jimmy, it's gonna be fine. <laughs> Sure it is. I, I wish you very well, and it probably may not be fine. So it's probably going to be a really big problem because uh, for a number of different reasons. So be careful with the co-ownership stuff. And the banks that you go to, be mindful of the fact that it may just be a teller who has a form and they don't know. They're not purposely trying to mess with you. They just aren't well trained necessarily. And so it's really important to, to know what it is that you're signing and make sure that you've got the designation on there that you actually want it, want it to be. Um, Healthy lifestyle provision, that was back to my really absurd Coke example. Um, but we can make sure that there are provisions in there that say that the person has to be maintaining a healthy lifestyle that you would support. Otherwise, they forfeit their share. 
Uh, blended families, we can deal with that. Spendthrift, if they've got creditor problems. And business succession planning issues. When people have businesses, there's all sorts of additional issues with that. And one of the things that we talked about at the break with one of the other individuals is, well, why would there be an unknown debt? Well, maybe there was a business and one of the spouses took out a personal line of credit that they didn't necessarily tell you about to float that business for six months or something. That may be one of those debt situations, so we can help with that as well. Or any estate planning attorney, since this is designed to be very general. But there's my contact information, <laughs> just in case. So if you have any questions, please do feel free to email me. Um, and I hope that today was helpful for you guys and that you feel well educated. Hmm? Is there, is that the the, oh, so the website. My business cards are in the back if you'd like my email. See, I tried to keep it general. I'm not even directing you to me. Thank you very much. You guys were great. <laughs>